Welcome to the podcast, Marianne. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. So I I was so excited to have you on the podcast today. Uh, even though we've had a pre conversation, uh, you know, it's it's not every day that you get to talk to uh, you know somebody who's written a book, right? So I, you're one of the first guests I'm speaking to who has actually written an entire book. So for the audience and everyone listening, Marion has written this book that is called Kill with Fire, uh, and uh, being somebody who is in the system. Uh, who works uh, in the space of technology, you really don't talk about killing systems. But so, uh, Marianne, so as we begin, you know, like, uh, let us know about uh, what are you doing nowadays? I know I already talked about you being an author, but you've been in tech for a while. So let -hmm. everyone know about who you are, what you're doing right now, and kind of do an introduction for the people. Sure. So my name is Marianne Bellotti. I've been in tech for I mean, a good solid 20 years, but I, I started programming when I was 13 years old. So if you count from then, it's actually been, I don't want to date how old I am, but it's been much, much longer than that. If you count from when I actually first started like working with computers and like programming computers, I don't always count that because I, I like to joke that I, I spent like the first 10 years of my professional career trying not to become a software engineer as desperately as possible. Like I, I wanted to do international development. I wanted to travel. I wanted to go out and see the world. And like at the time, that really wasn't what computer people did, right? Um, And so that ended up being hugely beneficial to me because it built out this set of skills around how organizations work and like this notion that like not every place was like the place that I lived in and the community that I grew up in, right? That like other people had different ways of organizing things. Um, and so when I finally did come back and come into tech around probably 2010 sort of area and become a professional software engineer, um, I was coming with a very different perspective on uh, how to think about systems. And I worked for a, uh, basically as a data engineer somewhere in the like private sector, public sector kind of intersection. Like I did a lot of work for organizations like the UN um, and some government work and then some startups in the New York area. And so um, as I started to grow grow my career, I realized that the work that I really loved doing was um, the system rescue type work where as other engineers were afraid to be on call or like didn't want to be in the incident room and like flip panic, nothing, let nothing go wrong while I am near the system. I was kind of like, yeah, let's go. Like, this is great. You know? So, I mean, I, I, that is a, you have to be a very strange sort of personality to enjoy that type of work. And I found that I did enjoy it quite a lot. And uh, as it went on, I found that I actually seemed to be uh, somewhat good at it. And so that has sort of been my specialization since then. I tend to work on a lot of uh, legacy systems, a lot of old computer systems. I look at you in three specific functions or the way you're operating right now, right? You've worked on like rescue systems, how to help, you know, people who are trying to be on these old systems move, want to move to, you know, main uh, modern systems, you know, and you're helping them out there. But you also have a function as an author (laughs) and you Mm -hmm. also help companies on training them or Mm -hmm. the folks and helping them learn as to how they need to look at these systems and evolve and plan these things out with the experience that you've had. Mm. And what was uh, really interesting for me was also the fact that you call yourself a software engineer and a relapse anthropologist. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, like when I started doing the legacy modernization work, everybody thought about that as being a completely different type of technical work. It was discussed as if, modernizing systems was entirely different process from building them. And one of the first things I noticed when I got into the weeds on it is that the things that worked when you were modernizing systems also work really well when you were building new systems as well, right? And so I think that basically comes from that background in anthropology. So when I when I went to college, I, I was kind of bored with the idea of being a computer science major, so as an anthro major. Uh, and that is how I got my like gallivanting around the world for the first 10, 10 years of my life is like as a, a person who'd studied anthropology. And I find that it's at the foundation for how I think. I always go back 
to that perspective. And so, and, and, and honestly, uh, computer science is not unfriendly to that perspective at all. I think we kind of whitewash that narrative out of our history. Like people know Conway's law. Very few people have read Conway's actual essay that developed that law because like you'll, you'll listen to people talk about Conway's law and they'll talk about it as if, um, you know, in order to get the correct architecture on a project, you should reorg. Right. And I'm like, that's not at all what he's saying. Right? Like yes, the, the, if you wanted to give it like a one sentence summary, people build systems that look like their org charts is an accurate one sentence summary of Conway's law. But when you read his actual essay, what he's talking about is not where the boxes are on the PowerPoint org chart. He's talking about communication pathways. He's talking about information silos. He's talking about how people actually relate to one another and how they communicate with one another and how they identify who's in their in-group and who's in their out-group. He's not talking about like arbitrarily moving things around confluence and now you're fixed, right? And so it's really interesting the degree to which anthropology and the study in like organizational science has heavily influenced are thinking about computer systems in the very beginning, but how um, committed we are to ignoring that fact. And so I found a nice little like happy niche in this area. And so for other people, it seems sometimes odd that I have this specialization and yet I work primarily in a technical field, either writing code or supervising people who are writing code. But I think uh, for me, it's it's like the best, it fits like a glove. It's, it's so much fun. And what you were saying is part of what is your... Pri- primary focus or your philosophy to how you're working right now is like how culture influences uh, the implementation and the development of software and uh, i've never come across people who are also looking at that aspect so when you were talking about the conway's law you were kind of talking about some of the things that i was really fascinated when i saw your profile and when we were having this conversation so so let's dive a little bit more deeper into what you were talking about like this rescue operation that you're doing for large scale systems right um can you like expand on that a little bit more as to what were your some of some of your adventures of course we don't have to go through uh kind of uh, talk about some of the highlights of these rescue operations i would say that that a lot of times the first question the most insightful question is why is this a legacy system in the first place because people act like oh well it's legacy because it's old but really it's legacy because it's not maintained right like there are plenty of systems that we've that have been running for like decades that people do not identify as legacy systems and do not complain about because there's a lot of effort to operating and maintaining them right so they don't feel like they're old systems because we change them on a regular basis we keep them up to date we keep them fresh um inevitably the stuff that we identify as legacy is stuff that's been neglected Right. And so that's a situation where that happened for a very specific reason. The there's something about this system that the the doesn't provide enough value or the organization doesn't understand its value. Right. So one of the first things I tell new engineers in this world is that um, you're going to your natural instinct is going to be to sort of like belittle and put the system down because all you're going to see is all the things that are wrong with it, all the things that are strange and foreign and just seem like not the way you would do things today. But the thing you have to remember about legacy systems is that legacy systems at the end of the day are successful systems. People use them. They provide some sort of value because if they didn't, we'd have the easiest modernization path in the world. We just turn the thing off, right? So if we can't turn the thing off, it's because it's providing some sort of value. But it's also that value is not being well communicated to the organization itself because they haven't actually been investing in it and maintaining it. And so that's really how I structure my engagements is this, what is the value that this thing is bringing to the table and why aren't we communicating that? And I talk a lot about um, when when I plan out what we do and what order we do it in, I always take a tack that for a lot of people comes off as really counterintuitive. My first instinct is to find the biggest, most complicated part of the problem and to tackle that first. Because you have the most buy-in, the most momentum in the beginning. Over time, your executive stakeholders, particularly non-technical ones, are going to look at your modernization effort and go, is this still going on? Like, oh, I I need funding over here for this thing. 
And like, there's funding over here. Let's cut the funding over here, right? So when do you want to do the biggest, hardest, most complicated part of the project? Do you want to do it when you have little funding, when you're fighting for staffing, when you have like no attention of executive stakeholders? Or do you want to do it in the beginning when you have the most amount of resources you ever will have, right? And then on top of that, when you're successful at tackling that tough, meaty problem, everything else becomes easier at that point because you both have the momentum, you have proof of concept and you're, you, the snowball's just rolling down the hill. A lot of times what I'll see happen with modernization projects is they start, they want to like say migrate to a new platform, right? And so they start with something small and simple to prove it out, right? And then they get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. Well, what happens when you get to like the more complicated use case, the platform you want to use doesn't work, right? You You've now migrated half of the system onto this other thing and you can't migrate the other half of the system. So you know, it's Frankenstein like system. You've just you've literally made things worse. So my first instinct is always to go for like, what is like, let's put things in order of like impact and, and uh, their complexity and then see if we can find something on the higher side of that scale where we feel like we can do this successfully. No, when you were saying that, you know, I was, there were two comments that you made that I really enjoyed or kind of relate with, right? One is that uh, the the comment that when new people come into looking at an old system, right? Uh, they look at it, like, as you were saying, belittling it at, because they knew something new and they have this latest tech going on and, they, and they're like, well, this thing is so old, we need to move that. But yeah. they forget. Uh, and I think it's glad, I'm glad that you brought that up, the point that a legacy system has been running for quite some while successfully right yep. so it's and that's something uh, from i would say from an empathetic point of view from the social idea of being developers and working in a, an ecosystem of developers or with a team we have to realize that those systems work well the yep. question is uh, and i kind of bring that up myself when i'm looking at migrating old stuff is that how important is it for this old things to look new like uh, yeah you're talking about remodernizing how important is it what are you losing you know yeah. for as a company i mean i go back to looking at objectives and if the company doesn't do this what is the loss of the business yeah. objectives are equally something important for me so i really like what you were saying there the second aspect i liked is and i recently had somebody else on the podcast who actually did this major migration across their company and did some legacy migration and i like what he said they went after the worst most complex system first because they felt as to your point if they could do that one and if that one works that means anything and everything in work because you've kind of dealt with uh, the worst closet uh, in your room, you know, uh, you know, and you have to fix that one. So, so I, I appreciate that you brought those points up as a seasoned rescue person of, you know, old legacy systems. Um, the question I wanted to ask you was like, when you go and recommend that or suggest that to somebody who is thinking of going for the easiest you know, problem to solve, how do they take it? And how do you help them kind of, uh, you know, look at that and change their mind towards looking at a complex system yeah. as the priority? Yeah. So I sometimes get um, misclassified as a security expert because so often that's the the lever that I pull to like get people comfortable with these things is um, when we're doing kind of a system overview I, I am looking at security impacts and security vulnerabilities because it is just the most effective way to get non-technical parts of the organization aligned and responding, right? The idea that they might get hacked, that they might be vulnerable to ransomware, that something awful like in the block Hollywood blockbuster style of things might happen to them. Like it helps like calm and align everybody. But I also want to pull out something that you you, you said before. Um, I think the risk taking is balanced by the um, resistance to fetishizing new technology, which is definitely a thing that actually happens. Um, I don't mind systems that are written in COBOL. Like I don't give a damn, right? Like you, you are your systems entirely in COBOL. Excellent. Great. Wonderful. Right. I care about your ability to maintain it. Right. And so I have this concept that I talk about with people all the time. I'm not really I'll use the term modernization because it helps people figure out what I'm talking about. But my preference actually isn't to modernize systems necessarily. I say restore to operational excellence. 
I don't care how old the technology is. I care that you have people that know how to run it, that there's more than one guy that knows what the thing does, right? That you feel comfortable operating and maintaining it. So as long as we can get to that point, I don't, no, honest to God, I do not care how old the hardware is, how old the software is or anything like that. And so, but you'll see a lot of people come in and they'll just be like, well, I mean, obviously you're going to move this all to Kubernetes. That's the only way we can make everything better. And I'm just, just like, why? <laughs> why? Right? So I think uh, it's, it's those two things in combination. If you are, are uh, like just too much in love with the idea of like what's new and current and trendy uh, and you're going to take those kind of risks, you're going to end up taking those kind of risks unnecessarily, right? So it's that balancing act of understanding why it's actually necessary to make a change in a particular way and then being being willing to take the risks. I have this thing that I do um, with my engineering groups we're on a legacy system. It's kind of like a game. So one year I was on this system that had been built in like the mid nineties. Um, and it was a, a data, it was data infrastructure. And uh, I actually thought it was quite remarkable. Uh, and everybody on my team thought, oh God, this is an awful, like awful mess, like just terrible. But because it was doing multi-master replication, but again, it was built at a time when multi-master replication wasn't actually a feature of SQL databases, right? And then it was doing what we would do with S3 uh, through databases. And again, S3 would be the perfect thing to use, but it didn't exist. And so I had, I had a group of engineers, young engineers who were very much like this system sucks, blah, blah, blah. Like the engineers who built it must be idiots, blah, blah, blah. And so finally one day I was like, all right, let's whiteboard this out. How would you, these are the, the features and the requirements of the system today. This is what it does. How would you build it? Uh, but you've got to build it in 1993, right? And so they're like, yeah, no problem, easy. They get up to the whiteboard, they start drawing it out. I'm like, okay, this wasn't invented until 2007, it's gone, right? And this wasn't around until like 1999 and it's 1993. So sorry, you're, you're a couple years away, right? And as we kept going through it over and over again and they kept redoing the architecture, redoing the architecture, eventually there's a point where they stop and they realize that they are looking at the architecture that was built in 1993. They have essentially done the exact same thing and used the exact same solutions. And that was an incredible exercise because again, like you said, it triggered empathy. Suddenly they realized these people that they're talking to are not idiots, that they actually built something really amazing because they built it before any of the tooling existed to do it the way we would do it today. And it helped them understand and value the system and therefore then come into those conversations with like a lot better attitude rather than just looking and being like, ew, look, I don't want to touch this, all right? I have so much respect for uh, people who have built these systems, right? And we go into conversations like I with Cockroach Labs, you know, or other companies that I've worked with, we have really essentially helped companies scale with the, the massive amount of data that they're generating. And sometimes old systems don't work. But whenever we go into conversations, I at least have observed that these people who have been doing this for 20, 30 years really bring a perspective that maybe sometimes even we are not thinking about, you know, from a business point, because they have so much expertise. So I feel like it's really awesome that uh, you are advocating for that idea back into how we do, you know, migrations and scenarios like that. Uh, one question I wanted to ask was related to what you were saying, when we when we're talking about these large systems or legacy systems, what I have personally experienced is folks being on say, IBM mainframe, you know, mm -hmm. or like uh, DB2 and things like that, uh, without going into details of accounts where you worked at, what mm -hmm. are these large systems that you're talking about, uh, where folks were at? And what were the platforms that you moved them to that you felt was the right choice for them technology-wise? Yeah, so I see a lot of hybrid mainframe cloud type stuff. Um, and that, what I mean by that is that the, the original system uh, is still there. It's still on, sometimes it's still on the original hardware, which always blows my mind whenever I show up and there's literally a machine from like the eighties running in the basement somewhere. I get real that's happy. True. Good days. <laughs> no, I, I've, no, I've that's, seen that's that happen. <laughs> but <laughs> like, they'll, so they'll have the original system running. And then over time, there's uh, a desire by the business side of the organization. When I say business, I mean, I mean, primarily like business mission, like not, they aren't necessarily for profits. Um, the business side of the organization at some point, 
probably early 2000s into mid uh, 2000s kind of go, oh, there's this thing called the internet. We should we should be getting data there. We should get connected to the internet. And so they build like these layers of middleware of various stages of complexity, uh, usually in Java, to sit on top of the mainframe and interact between the mainframe and the public internet, right? And so sometimes when we come in, they've already done a couple of cycles in modernization and they've moved that Java middleware into the cloud and now they're trying to figure out how to get the mainframe code into the cloud, which is a thing you can do. I think if you pay IBM lots of money, they will help you do it. Uh, it's, it's a thing. Um, but sometimes not, right? And so uh, a lot of times when you see like uh, these outages on mainframe systems and like COBOL get thrown around. Like the, the last one that I think really got a lot of attention was um, the state of New Jersey when they were doing their COVID benefits processes there, they had a major outage and people tend to gravitate towards the mainframe and the COBOL part of that story. But I had a bunch of friends who called me and I was not, I was not in the loop on the New Jersey thing. Although I had a lot of co former colleagues that were in the loop on the New Jersey thing. So uh, I said the same thing. I always say that in these sort of situations, I have um, it's almost never the COBOL or the mainframe that actually triggers an outage like this. Like every single time I've been thrown an outage like this, it's the Java. It's 100%. Something in that middle layer goes haywire and triggers a huge colossal outage. It's like when when your mainframe hardware fails, it's like uh, mainframes are kind of like... You, you, they just pick back up wherever they left off. They're they're very tolerant, right? So if hardware does fail and like they do have outages in that, but it's like, okay, we swap the hardware out, we turn the mainframe back on, oh, way to go. And like the same thing with a, a COBOL problem. It's like generally you just restart the job and away you go, right? So when you see these massive outages, it's almost always in the, in the middleware. And so that becomes the question of like, well, what do we do with all of this, right? Because like, are we moving it? If we're moving it all into the cloud, I'm not a huge fan of like moving COBOL into the cloud. I feel like that's a little counterintuitive. So my preference would be if our if our decision is to move everything into the cloud because we we have decided that our primary interaction point with our customers is going to be through the internet, then that's a situation where we'll probably look at like rewriting the application as a whole, right? Um, but even then, like what I what I tend to do is that peel a, my, a service off and then integrate it back in, and peel a service off and then integrate it back in. So these are the kind of these are the kind of challenges that we have. And and I I think what's lovely about these kind of projects is that there are no silver bullets, right? Like the technique I use in one that was incredibly successful could be the absolute wrong thing to do in the next one. And it's not always about the technology. Again, it's a lot about the organization and what they're willing to invest in, right? You have an organization that isn't willing to invest in their people for whatever reason, saying to them, like, you need to rewrite it in Python and retrain your entire uh, tech staff. It's going to be an awful solution, right? Because they're just not there with you. They're not willing to retrain their people. So they're going to end up with a thing they don't know how to run in the end. Yeah. I mean, what you said is interesting because I think that that aspect of retraining and uh, how much effort is required from um, a, the point of your training folks is very critical, right? And what I have observed or one of my thoughts around this migration story is that that back in the day when it came to like running legacy systems or say mainframe, everybody needed mission critical or like those people who needed mission critical fault tolerance, those fundamental aspects stayed on uh, IBM mainframe and systems like that. But in today's day and age, pretty much everybody needs some sort of mission criticality where the application has to stay up. Because mm -hmm. if something goes down, somebody will go on Twitter and say, hey, this app doesn't work. That affects the customer experience, affects the business, affects the revenue, affects everything. So mm. gone are the days where you could take chance with having a, say, less scalable system or a system that would go down. And today it's like table stake requirement to have like a system that is fault tolerant, that has a disaster recovery. It's really, really near time RTO, RPO, right? Mm. Like those are the experience that folks are trying to build. So recent years, have you observed folks just moving towards the cloud 
or moving to uh, you know an architecture that is generally fault tolerant for everything or they're like still trying to use the same functions from before well when you say generally fault tolerant i'm like i, I want to say i haven't had many people who want to migrate onto erlang which i think is the most fault tolerant <laughs> but well little, little tiny shout out to the elixir community in there um I mean, yeah, yeah, there is a lot, there's still a, a really heavy push to move to the cloud, which I am not always convinced is the right thing. And, and, and I say that to clients, right? Particularly, like for me, the, the question of um, moving to the cloud is where does your data originate? And when you're done processing it, where are you going to store it long term? Because if your data originates on the public internet, then sure, let's move everything to the cloud because you keep it all in the cloud, right? But if your data originates off the cloud, and then ultimately you're going to use the cloud to do your processing, and then you're just going to move off the cloud again, you are going to get killed with exit charges, right? You're just absolutely murdered. And I think a lot of people just take it on face value of like, hey, the cloud will save you money. I'm like, no, Amazon is very, very good at hiding their expenses, right? <laughs> Every modern day software engineer has experienced this pain of like the Amazon bill that's like the the list of your for the, the length of your forearm that has things you never imagined you were paying for, right? So it can be a very good solution. Uh, I think it, it's still a really good fit for probably 90% of use cases, but it's not a perfect fit for everybody, right? So it's this, this question about like, what are your business processes? What are your values? Where do you actually want to want to invest um, in general? Uh, I think... <sighs> Like I, I, I have a complicated relationship with this idea of fault tolerant because it, I think I always think about how things are heard by people who don't have any experience with technology. And I think when we talk about fault tolerant, we get into this habit of thinking about um, system failure as being one, a preventable thing and two, a, a bad thing, right? And I don't think it's either. First, I think all technology fails eventually at some point, right? You, there is no technology that operates perfectly all the time. Um, and I think it's good for people to sort of like get, understand that and uh, um, really internalize it and not be scared of it. So I, we're in the middle of doing a, um, a modernization project right now. And one of the executive stakeholders said to me, well, well okay, this plan is fine as long as it doesn't go down. And I'm like, it's going to go down, man. <laughs> like, like, we're, we're literally moving. It's on a proprietary platform that I had never heard of that is so niche. They actually have to issue special laptops to the people that need to access this system because that's the only way it will run. Um, and I was like, we are going to attempt to move it onto a commercial cloud provider. And in theory... We think we have all the dependencies figured out. We think we have all the environmental factors figured out. But like, you know, everybody who's been through a, a first deploy of anything, even a brand new piece of technology knows the first time you turn that crank, what you get out is not like the nice sausage necessarily. <laughs> so it was for me, it was just like uh, managing that expectation that if your thought is like, oh, fault tolerant means that we're just going to turn on the new uh, deploy and turn off the old deploy and everything will be perfect. I have never seen that happen in my entire career in software. I've never seen that happen, right? Yeah, and I was saying I completely agree. I mean, when was the last time uh, we did not see an outage on an Amazon region in an year? Right? It happens <laughs> so frequently, right? Or uh, it happens in Google too, right? Uh, so my thought process is that if we are in the process of building the best possible fault tolerant system uh, and that is available however sh shit happens and it can affect uh, you know what engineers and architects have to do is build a system that is most likely on all the time or has a scenario where things are always available and that's what we are chasing i mean especially with yeah. folks we come across right they are trying to uh, work on mission critical applications and we help them with our architecture because we have a, like a peer, peerless architecture and we write and replicate data across multiple regions and if you want to do it across multiple cloud but again the, the challenge happens is not everybody uh, is aware of the cost associated on the cloud right like as you were saying right nobody talks about the amount of uh, 
money has somebody has to spend between data transfer or egress cost between AWS to Google Cloud. And that's something nobody thinks about. Well, people think about it, but they really don't know until they get that people first bill. People don't the longest bill think about it. No one else thinks about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, they, they think about it when the bill comes and then they will ask the architect, were you not aware of this? <laughs> when you're trying to do the first deployment, things can generally... Uh, go down but of course you've done so much work into it you know how to fix it so yeah yeah and i think uh, what's important about managing these kind of expectations is my concern is never will the thing go down or won't the thing go down my concern is is the thing going down going to mean that people get cold feet and cancel the whole project or like cripple the whole project right because it's like that really then becomes um what you end up worse off, you have kind of half finished work, which is just more technical debt, like sprinkles of technical debt on top of your Sunday of technical debt, right? And so like I had a, a customer the other, a couple months ago that wanted to do a load test. And I thought, great, let's do a load test on the system. That's excellent. They're like, yes, we're going to test up to 100 million concurrent users. And I had to be like, okay, that's a third of the population in the United States. That's more people than watch the Super Bowl, all right? So, like, sure, like, I, if they're going to, like, error on the side, on each side, error on the side of being overprepared rather than being unprepared, let's error on the side of overprepared. That, that's fine. But I was concerned that, like, when their infrastructure did not scale to 100 million concurrent users, that they would then read too much into that as a signal. And I was just pushing back on, like, realistically speaking, how many people actually like use this service at one time? Is it, is it a third of the U S population uses the service at one time? Or is it like maybe only a million concurrent users use it at one time? So yeah, I think my concern with these sort of things is never really about like, is it going to fail? It's more about like, what is the significance of that failure? And like, will we lose uh, some of the buy-in that we need uh, if it fails? And when the answer to that is yes, then that becomes, my my emphasis becomes on almost comms, right? I said it become like a, a spin doctor. Like I want to sp- be on the side of the the those executives and sort of like hold their hand and go, look, it's going to fail. It's fine. We expected it to fail. Everything's great. Don't worry. Isn't this wonderful? Yeah. It failed, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I think the key is to to your point, right? Is to level set with the folks you are trying to engage with, right? Like I've I've been in situations where uh, we have to run performance tests, and to your point, right? Like not everybody is running Black Friday level workloads every day. Not yeah. everybody is running, um, you know, the Super Bowl level workloads every day. However, you do have to build a system that can scale. Of course. And what happens there is that folks say, well, I want a system like that. And then we say, well, that requires this much amount of investment in terms of hardware and building. And then that becomes like a bottleneck. So there is this negotiation where we come together on what is the ideal solution that is optimized for what you really need for your running your business and for whatever objectives and goals you have. And I think this kind of, uh, you know, experience is kind of rallied across multiple places you every team right now that is working at different tech companies is having this sort of a conversation about infrastructure and investment and all these things with respect to the business objective yeah so so i I like what you said i mean i mean i think it's true to where it is you know um so anyways let's i wanted to ask you something i know Hmm. we we are moving very quickly with time here uh about uh, your book as well right so you you wrote this book kill it with fire and initially when i read the uh, title i thought maybe this is like a fictional book or something <laughs> but then and then because it felt like a mockingbird uh you know hunger games kind of yeah. <laughs> title. <laughs> uh, so so uh, tell me a little bit about why did you write a book and mm-hmm. what is this book all about and what led you to this you know so. the title i admit is a little bit of a bait and switch um, because it's very it's very aggressive, right? Not only is it called Kill It With Fire, but on the comes uh, on the cover is a dumpster fire, and that was actually like a requirement I gave my publisher when we negotiated my deal. I was like, I want there to be dumpster fire on the cover of this book, and they were like, Okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, but yeah, the book inside, 
I am a huge fan of legacy systems. The waste people are fans of Antiques Roadshow, right? Like, I think they're fascinating. I love old computer systems. I'm not turned off by them at all. And largely kind of have this celebratory attitude about it. Again, legacy systems are successful systems, right? And so the book is broadly about um, how to nurture such systems and like restore them to a certain operations level, right? Which is the exact opposite of what the cover suggests. But I was, the reason why I wanted to do that is because I sort of wanted to play off people's uh, preconceived notions, right? It doesn't do any good for me to write a book about legacy systems and modernizing them that only speaks to people who modernize legacy systems, right? Like all the people who spend their time working on COBOL mainframes love this book, but would have loved this book no matter what, right? Because it, it's, it speaks to them and what they deal with. But like the real value is reaching out to engineers who thought, who think to themselves, I will never have to deal with any of these systems. And that's a thing I used to hear quite a lot where people would go like, I don't deal with any legacy code. And then I'd be like, what the hell do you call that like JavaScript thing you have from like 2005 that's just hanging around, right? Like, what is that thing exactly? We're like now 10,000 JavaScript frameworks into the future from where that thing was written, right? You know, it's, so it's like, I think... Most people who go into um, technology today kind of envision themselves as working for like a hot startup, building everything from scratch. And a lot of times the narrative around what it's like to be a software engineer kind of assumes you're building something from scratch. And I'll say to professional software engineers, when did you ever build, like, <laughs> how often does that really happen in your career? Normally you start a new job, you have like these established code bases you have to figure out. That's much more common then you build things from scratch. So all of the skills that you need when you're modernizing a system, when you're working with a really complex legacy system are also really valuable when you're working on newer systems. And so I wanted the tone of the book and the book to present itself in a way that was compelling to people who don't think that they'll ever be modernizing systems so that you could sort of absorb the knowledge. Many folks who are in the process of you know what you just said experience like a dumpster fire or like that's like a common experience yeah. or a you know term that we have oh well what are you what are you up to today i'm just trying to uh, deal with the dumpster fire you know so it's it's relatable uh, yeah. and i think that's that's what uh, i think i liked about just the just that uh, you know the title and everything and i'm going to read the book obviously because i ordered it on amazon uh, mm-hmm. and it's going to come and uh, i'll <laughs> i'll give you my two cents on it although i have not worked on old systems like cobalt a lot but i do talk yeah. to a lot of people who are in the process of migration and so hopefully yeah. it'll help me so thanks for giving me that it's hopeful for people like us <laughs> 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 right uh so that's cool uh, so uh, i remember you know mary and when we you and i were talking um we were talking about this whole idea of how systems have changed right like yeah. we, we were talking i was telling you about hey look at this we had no sequel then we had no sequel uh, we had sequel to no sequel now we have distributed sequel we went yeah. from having infrastructure as it is to vms yeah. and our kubernetes uh, right and i was and the pattern that i wanted to talk to you was this whole rise of the monolith right where yeah. we've where we've gone from monolithic systems broken into agile systems and uh, you know lambda functions uh, and micro yeah. microservices or nano microservices and now we're going back to this monolith and uh, what's your perspective on what's happening with that part of tech right now when yeah. software engineering well two things in general and i describe this at length in in the book um, I think people tend to pers- to assume that technology advances linearly. That we get progressively more advanced as we move on. And when you actually kind of like look at the trends in technology, what you start to realize is that, that it cycles. It is moving uh, to greater capacity. It's moving to greater speed, more data. There are advancements, right, that look linear, but the actual paradigms that we use tend to be cyclical. So um, one of the stories I tell is that what kicked off that train of thought for me was working on a mainframe system. And uh, one of the Kamajini engineers kind of very dismissively said to me, they want us to migrate. Like when when, uh, they came in um, in the 90s, they wanted us to get rid of our thin clients talking to a mainframe and migrate everything to desktop applications and fat clients on desktop applications. And now they want us to migrate to thin clients the, on the cloud, right? That this is fundamentally the same thing. We used to be time sharing on mainframes. Now we're time sharing on like Amazon's 
giant, massive compute environment, right? And I realized that, that he had a point, right? The, the implementation uh, had changed. And a lot of the details of um, the protocols and things like that had changed. But fundamentally, the paradigm of time sharing on a mainframe versus buying time on a compute cluster is the same, right? And so you can sort of see those patterns everywhere where we're, we're, we're kind of rotating through these cycles. And I go into a lot of detail um, in terms of like the science behind why that is. Like what are the forces that sort of push us to shifting? And I suspect that we're going to see another shift within the next 10 to 20 years out of these cloud software as a service environments into something that like kind of follows a private data center model, but doesn't look like a private data center. So my purse, if I was bet putting a bet on it, I would look at like what we've been doing with mesh networks and a local for software, because I think in addition to all of the economic uh, reasons why uh, I think we'll be pushed there, I think there's a huge des desire on privacy and data sovereignty and a lot of discomfort with all of our data just being in a giant pool somewhere owned by a corporation somewhere. So I think we will see those cycles again. Uh, one of the things that's already happening is that optical computing is pushing us back into analog machines, which I find fascinating. I wrote a whole blog post about this on on uh, my Medium uh, that I, I, so I will give you the link so you can send it to your readers if they want to look it up. But it's like because of the structure of how light works, uh, we are able to build better processors for optical computers if they follow an analog pattern versus a digital pattern. So uh, that's fascinating. I wanted to ask you, because you were talking about this, is what's the tech or the tech trend that you are kind of seeing in the last, say, six to nine months or maybe last one, two years that you feel you're really excited about for the future? I'm really, really into uh, formal methods. So a large part of what I do is about how people reason about systems, right? Like I, I do kind of the organizational part, um, but then once you get to the engineers, you're dealing with a system that like often, if there is documentation, who knows when the last time it was updated, right? And like a lot of times we don't have any tests. Like, so for me on a new system, the first thing I wanna see are the tests, like ideally the unit tests, but if we don't have unit tests, I'll take regression tests, I'll take integration tests, I'll take manual test cases, I will take whatever I can get, right? Because this for me is the purest, most accurate form of documentation is like that description of we did this and the system should do this and not this, right? Um, and so a lot of times on the older systems, none of that stuff exists. And so people are just kind of flying blind and they're afraid to make changes because they have absolutely no idea if the changes are actually going to affect other processes that they're not aware of. And like, maybe like the system will, will not even crash, but just make mistakes. Right. And so I'm very interested in how people reason about systems, how they build mental models about systems, how they transition that knowledge to other people. And I think there's a lot of exciting things going on in this space around using formal modeling to help people find bugs in systems, um, deduce the behavior of systems, uh, manage complexity. So what has historically always blocked that set of technologies from really taking off has been that the models are really, really difficult to write, right? And then once they're written, you know, the, fundamentally the same problem you do with documentation, which is they're out of date almost immediately. And then they they no longer reflect what the system looks like. And I'm seeing both new methods and approaches to how we apply those models. One example being um, the rise of like chaos engineering and that kind of complexity testing has created a scenario where perhaps the purpose of the model isn't implementation. Perhaps the purpose of the model is to do that baseline hypothesis testing so that you coming into a large scale failure test like that really having a good idea of like how the system's supposed to behave and exactly how you might be able to trigger failure instead of just like turning things off and hoping something interesting happens. So we see those kind of patterns. But what I think is going to be really interesting is um, a lot of this formal logic is arguably the first generation of AI. And now you have what's going on with the second generation of AI that's based on statistical models and its power in generating 
content and trans and translating content. And so I've had multiple people sort of come up to me and say like, can we use the language model to write the specification or to write the logic model? And I find that idea really, really interesting because I think the answer will be kind of, but not really. I think the answer will be the, the language model can write the first draft of what the specification should be. And then you have to refine it with the details. But even if you get that far, that would be, that would just be a, a game changing for a lot of, of technical orgs to be able to sort of create these kind of models and run them as simulations, of like how their systems behave. Like I get really excited about that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, I also feel like that's a really good, I mean, what you mentioned is a great use of how AI can help, uh, you know, companies, enterprises, you know, so that's, 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 it'll be interesting how that shapes up already. I mean, we can see certain patterns where AI is producing really great boilerplate code. And again, it requires a good engineer's creativity to turn that into a masterful code, you know, so, so I'm fascinated by uh, that aspect as well. Well, as we as we getting to like the close of the podcast, right? You know, I want I was just thinking recently. A few people hit me up from you know Kenya, and some people reached out to me from Australia. So the podcast is kind of going across the continent right now uh, from North America, and it's it's interesting uh, that lots of people who reached out to me are people who are building systems and who are really um, you know asking for hey how can people you know work on complex systems and problems and solve those things so i'm really excited that they get to listen to somebody like you in the next episode and they get to know how to deal with that but as we go in and shout out to warren from kenya who reached out to me what is your advice for you know software engineers today who are trying to build systems and what are your one two at least two three things that you think they should kind of do on a on a day-to-day -day basis to kind of make sure that they're building great systems? Yeah, well, I would say, um, don't go out and deliberately build complex systems. <laughs> like, I know I know, for a lot of people, like saying you built a system of certain size or a certain scale is like, you know, that's the thing you want to put on your resume. But if you have a choice between building a simple system and a complex system, definitely build a simple system. And then I would say that um, my biggest, uh, architectural North Star is always capacity of the engineers on the engineering team. So we were talking about like the uh, kind of restoration of the reputation of a monolith and the trend away from services and microservices and things like that. And um, I had always sort of told people that you build the architecture of your system is determined by how many six people on call rotations you can run, right? And it's six people because in order to have a nice healthy on call rotation, I want there to be a fallback person so that it's not just one person misses a page and everything's a disaster, right? So it's a six, you have a six person rotation, you can run a, a primary and a secondary and you, you then can run like a one week on call where people basically are on call once a month. Uh, and so that's, usually pretty sustainable for people. It's not too stressful. And so that's kind of like my, my, my peg for uh, how those things should be structured. And it becomes a really great forcing function in talking about exactly how many services we can maintain without like disaster. A lot of times what happens is that people are like, everything has to scale, right? Everything has to scale. There should be nothing that can't scale. And it's like, well, that's just not realistic, right? So, by, by talking about the capacity of your people, like what kind of work-life balance you want the people who are going to be running this to have, that gives you something that's like a good solid reference point to start to plan your architecture around that is based on something you know, right? And so that's always been kind of my principle for how to design systems is I think about like how many people do I have and how do I best want to use their time, right? Yeah. I, I think some, one thing I really like about what you're saying is that the realness with which you have to approach building systems, right? You have to consider who's going to manage it and operate it. And those are things that we don't think about, uh, you know, when we are building these systems right now. So I'm glad that you brought it up. And it's, 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 it's awesome that we have people like you who are looking at these uh, fundamental ideas and bring that into the industry and helping leaders understand this aspect as well. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Awesome. So I know we are up on time. Uh, so for everyone listening, 
uh, Marion has this book called Kill It With Fire that we were just talking about. Uh, it's available on Amazon. We'll also link it or I'll link it when I you know release the episode out. Uh, she also uh, can be reached out through LinkedIn and Bellotti.tech. That's her uh, uh, page. Uh, and you also have a Medium blog. What is that called? Uh, it's Medium. And then under um, my handle on most social networking platforms is Belmar, B-E-L-L-M-A-R. So it's medium.com slash Belmar. Maybe a subdomain now. May have changed it. But it's linked on all my other things. <laughs> oh, awesome. No, that's great. And uh, no, I mean, it's been awesome to have you. Uh, everyone listening, go follow Marianne. And I hope you've enjoyed listening to us kind of geek out, geek out about big systems here. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if you had come at the beginning of this call, uh, before we recorded, we also had Marianne's cat uh, on the podcast. <laughs> so... Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's lurking around somewhere. <laughs> he was. He uh, was sitting like right over here. And then he kind of made this maneuver like he wanted to sit in my lap and cuddle. And I was like, get away. So if you saw me like gesticulating in the early call, that was me nudging my cat off. off uh, but now he's decided that this is boring because I'm just talking about work. And he's off. Well, some other what, for whatever it's worth, you know, I thank you and the cat for being so generous with your time on the podcast, you know, and I, I really enjoyed our conversation, Marianne, and I wish you the best with the book and with everything that you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. And I really look forward to like the your listeners kind of jumping into the conversation. Mm-hmm.